to bore you with a presentation about the feasibility study now, if you don't mind. <laughs> I'd like to thank Ms. Kamen for what must have been a lifetime of hours spent on this. Um, and just to preface just me, the, my staff too. <laughs> and, the, and the staff and Mr. Gist. And to preface the, the beginning of this, this presentation with, for those of you who don't realize that this is a study that is done every year. The, the proposal that's in the study is the beginning, it's a starting point for the conversation that will be happening over the next several months. So this is, there, there are a lot of reasons that it, it looks the way it does and hopefully by the time that the presentation's over, you'll understand some of that and then whatever questions are left will, some of them will be answered tonight and then there will be many months of, you will be so sick of hearing about this by November, you will get all of your questions answered. Thank you. Please. Ready? Yep. Board members, I'm going to start our presentation. Uh, to our members of our community, thank you for showing up this evening for this very important topic. Board members, tonight we present the 2017 feasibility study with the fierce urgency of now to support the needs of every Howard County Public School System student through the foundational principle of equity. The Board of Education and the county government leaders have charged me with a way to address our rapid growing student population. Tonight our plan represents a comprehensive way, and I state again, a comprehensive way to address the concerns of our school community to ensure equity across the system and to fulfill our fiduciary duties to our citizens and county government. As an individual who is relatively new to our school system, I have been greatly concerned about the incredible amount of growth which has occurred that has put great stress on our schools. The study that we're presenting tonight follows guidelines of policy 6010, school attendance areas, which the current board updated and approved this year and represents a change in approach from our redistricting plans in the past. As many individuals know, Howard County is the fastest growing county in Maryland. Currently, we have 56,000 students in our school system. Multiple schools at all three levels fall outside the target utilization levels of between 90 and 110 percent of building capacity. Projected enrollment in the next five years will place us well over 60,000 students. The study tonight that we're presenting addresses and proposes solutions to the issue of overcrowded schools in the eastern portions of the county and undercapacity schools in western Howard County. It forms the foundation for planning of the fiscal year 2019 capital budget. The challenging goal of a great school system is to equitably serve the needs of each student. When we balance our school capacities, we can achieve equity of educational delivery. The study recommendations take a closer look at that goal. Redistricting, as all of us know, is a difficult process for all concerned. We understand that it is a very emotional issue for our families. I want to assure you that we have taken every consideration in developing this study with the goal of creating an equitable education program that serves the needs of all students. But keep in mind that if this plan were implemented as presented tonight with full fidelity, all of our schools would be in the target utilization range per board policy of 90 and 110 percent. In essence, I'm presenting a solution, a comprehensive solution, to achieve the board's goals to the 90 and 110 percent capacity. We welcome the input of parents, staff, students and community members and we will actively listen to and consider your suggestions tonight is a starting point for the dialogue of which we've had much input to during my short seven weeks here everywhere i've been there has been conversation about the overcrowding in our schools our presentation tonight is to start the process and there's many opportunities for input which will end in terms of the timeline, which we will go over in detail 
on November 16th. So this is the beginning of a journey with many months of input, taking extremely serious, acknowledging the concerns of our community, but the overcrowding in our schools is well beyond what I ever anticipated where we would be at this moment in time. We must provide a comprehensive solution, and tonight, once again, begins that dialogue. Ms. Kamen. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Renee Kamen. I'm the manager of school planning. This evening, I, on behalf of the Office of School Planning and Capital Operations and Planning, will be presenting the 2017 Feasibility Study. This study, as Dr. Moderano just explained, is larger than in years past and contains recommendations for comprehensive school boundary adjustments. Before I begin, I wanna take a second to thank all those who are involved in the study, including my supervisors, Ms. Ms. Brown Dennis and Mr. Gist, as well as my staff, Jennifer Bubanko and Tim Rogers, and several interns who probably thought they were just gonna get us coffee this summer, um, but we've put them, uh, started them running. Um, it was only a year ago or thereabouts, I was sitting in front of the board with my predecessor as the newest uh, member of the operations staff presenting the policy charter to the board members. Tonight, I'm here to um, present the 2017 recommendations. The feasibility study gives the board the first look at enrollment projections. This report is also used to highlight capital improvement or CIP options and to gain direction on school boundary adjustment plans. Finally, we use this report to provide annually the overall multi-year strategy that staff is considering. My office, the superintendent, and the Board of Education are guided by the purpose, standard, and responsibilities outlined and described in Policy 6010. Every year, regardless of recommended school boundary adjustments, this process will occur. <clears throat> Policy 6010 de designed the feasibility study to relate to the capital budget and the school boundary adjustments. This chart up on the screen uh, graphically shows the annual steps the capital budget on the left, which is blue, happens. The school boundary adjustments is on the right and happens less frequently. We, our office, the school planning office, begins every winter with enrollment projections leading to this document. If the feasibility study recommends redistricting for the current year like this year, um, the process on the right is initiated. A school boundary adjustment may help us with capital planning needs so the process feeds back then into the capital budget. The annual enrollment projection is really the foundation for the planning and the feasibility study and the capital budget and occupies the majority of the winter in my office. We collect data from Howard County Public School System. Yes, we collect it from ourselves. Um, the capital budget, or excuse me, state and local agencies and use our GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems, to map the data and ensure we gain school level insights about trends. The data is used to project September 30th enrollment, which is sent to the Maryland Department of Education. We use in our office a method called historic cohort survival, which looks at past student population patterns within the county to construct survival ratios in projecting a particular grades migration through the school system. You can see it in the graph on the screen. The yellow shows a cohort of students moving through the system. In one year, they are kindergartners, and the second year, they're first graders. This particular cohort is exhi exhibiting a growing trend. As you can see, as you move, if, as you progress through the, the, their years in the school system, it's growing. We apply those histories to make our projections of what will happen next. In addition to calculate, calculation and application of cohort survival ratios, we also use data points in order to project student population, including live births, apartment turnover, new construction, regional program enrollment, re and resale of housing. All of these factors are put into our enrollment that you see every year throughout the, through the feasibility study. In February of 20, uh, 2017 and every February thereabouts, we um, do what's called a projection accuracy report. Um, last year um, for the September 30th enrollments for uh, 2016, uh, our countywide average, we were 99.4% accurate. So in other words, we're about 350-ish students off over countywide. Um, as we get down to doing school by school enrollment projections, we were 81% of our schools were 95% accurate or better. That means we had a 5% error rate, which is on target for most um, uh, municipalities across the state of Maryland. 
Um, approximately 32% of those schools were within 10% of actual enrollment. And this year we actually um, had two schools that were perfect in terms of our um, projection for the school-wide population. Turning to trends, um, the 2017 projection is initially showing a modest um, growth. We compare three years over time, um, <clears throat> and this is showing the elementary school growth um, starting in 2017 going through 2016. Um, it does grow over time, and you will see on this chart that um, in 2024, we anticipate that we will be over capacity at the elementary school level of 110%. We'll start growing. That means the projected population is now exceeding the number of seats available at the schools for uh, elementary school children. Um, we anticipate this growth to be about 4,000 elementary school age kids um, by 2026. <clears throat> This is the trend showing for middle school enrollment growth. Um, middle school enrollment growth is as modest as well, um, and we do project about 2,200 um, students by 2026. <laughs> Capacity utilization of all middle schools combined will begin to exceed 110% um, beyond 2026. Um, most of the projected growth is in the east, and strategic capacity projects at individual middle schools should be considered for this growth. In other words, where the growth is, we should be adding capacity for those seats, for those children. And here above you and in front of you is the high school enrollment. Um, the high school enrollment is anticipated to increase by 28, 2,800 school students by 2026. The capacity utilization of all high schools combined will begin to exceed 110% capacity utilization beyond 2022. Based on the long-term growth trends, we need to continue planning for the 13th high school. This includes the purchase of land by county government in the eastern portion of the county and working collaboratively with Howard County government on the planning and site design of this property. Currently, high school 13 is um, anticipated to open in school year 2024. Um, this chart that you see in front of you is um, our projected growth from 2016. Um, our exact actual growth is on the right for K through 12. One thing that has to be noted is our office does K through 12 enrollment projections. Um, and so the actual enrollment you see here uh, is 54,000. That's for K through 12. Um, we anticipate an additional 900 students for September 30th of 2017. And by five years, about 7,100 additional students to the system. So the um, figure on the screen here um, represents the planning needs for fiscal year 2019. The feasibility study lays the basis for our uh, capital improvement program, and this is what it would look like. Um, the document actually is, this figure is 3.11 on page 15 of the feasibility study and shows how the long range plan evolves over time. The arrows in the chart um, show changes from recently approved capital budgets. So for this instance, um, you see a dot and an arrow for Ellicott Mills Middle School um, and it's going from 2024 to 2021. <clears throat> so the 2017 attendance area recommendations. Um, every, we have goals for this, the boundary adjustments. Um, the first was to provide a comprehensive boundary adjustment that considers balanced utilization at all school levels, strengthen school feeds, and continuous communities. Um, these are guidelines out of policy 6010, so if anyone's interested in the policy, they can look at the standards. Um, it's standard section B um, in the policy. Um, our other goals for this plan, obviously, is to open elementary school 42 um, for school year 2018 and 2019, utilize western capacity to balance utilization in the north and west Columbia regions, and utilize new capacities at Waverly Elementary and Swansfield Elementary School to balance utilization in the Colum north and the Col west Columbia areas. We're also proposing to adjust school boundaries at the middle school level to balance capacity utilization as well as align middle school feeds. Um, <clears throat> we're also proposing to adjust school boundaries at the high school level to utilize Western school capacity and align high school feeds from the middle school. We also incorporated feedback from community meetings that were held in April of this year. <clears throat> and so a little 
brief background on the meetings that we held. We um, had two public meetings. We also had an online uh, survey that mimicked the questions that were asked at the public forum. First and foremost, we asked what people valued about the current boundary process, and we heard over and over again the transparency, the public participation throughout. And I have to reiterate, this is only the beginning of the process. Right. We have many months ahead of us. Um, we will have many surveys ahead of us that we will be pushing out to the community to get um, feedback as plans develop. Um, and also people enjoyed, not enjoyed, but they liked the rules regarding the frequency of being redistricted. We also asked what concerns, and the concerns are actually in the flame to the left, and these are the most words that we kept hearing over and over again. Um, and that would be the program differences between schools at elementary school, um, small feeds and splitting communities were also concerns we heard, um, and the support of transition of students, which is not necessarily a redistricting um, for uh, us, but the after of redistricting, and also before and after care arrangements. We asked um, everyone uh, to ask us what kind of innovative ideas that they would have for either this boundary process or the planning phase. Um, several people said start from scratch and do a multi-level examination of all school levels, um, do an examination of proximity to school, um, and also just general communication enhancements like using next door apps, um, working with the PTAs or PTSAs to perhaps um, do more at the schools and have daycare options or night care options, babysitting. Um, and also perhaps since a lot of parents use Canvas. So we are exploring some of the suggestions that we've heard. We're gonna try to do what we can. Um, my staff is very limited during this time, but we're gonna try. Um, we handed everybody a sheet of paper with all of the factors that are in the policy, standard section B, and we asked folks to rank what was the three most and three least important um, factors when considering school boundary adjustments. Um, I had to put the top five for the three most because as you can see, three, four, and five are very close to each other in terms of response. But number one, two, and three are all fall into the category of what we call neighborhood um, under the policy, so that would include feeds, contiguous areas, and the frequency with which a student is reassigned. But also close behind four and five were actually um, capacity and the, the, the use of the building and using it wisely. The three least important factors um, that came out of this school were actually all of the demographics considerations that were put into the policy in January of this year. Um, <clears throat> So uh, they were the racial and ethnic composition, the level of ESOL learners, and as well as social socioeconomic of the school population. So if we were not to open elementary school 42, the resulting 2018 utilization is depicted up here on the screen. These are what, these are what the Office of School Planning considers our pre-measures or our base plan. You'll often hear us say pre-measure or base plan. This is what we start with. This is what our projection is for 2018 at the elementary school level. As you can see, eight schools are above the policy standard of 110% utilization and nine are below the policy um, of 90% utilization. So the following slides that I'm gonna go through um, are suggested staff boundary changes at the elementary school level. And this is really to start the conversation that we're gonna have over the next couple of months. And that is first to open elementary school 42, utilize new capacities at Waverly and Swansfield, utilize Western school capacities and adjust boundaries to assist with the middle school feeds. Um, so I've referenced each, every um, graphic you see up here on the screen matches to the appendix in the back of the feasibility study for ease of reference. Um, these are, this is page 79 and 80 of your uh, feasibility study. Um, and they're in the next few slides, few slides are in order of the plan pages. Um, the above graphics show the proposed changes in the northern region at Hollyfield Station, um, Manor Woods, Northfield, St. John's Lane, Waverly, and uh, Worthington. Specific polygon moves associated with all of these maps can be found and described on page 39 of the feasibility study. It tells you the sending and the receiving schools, um, and it tells the estimated 20, 2018, excuse me, projected population. This plan um, does propose to move 244 students out of Manor Woods into three schools, uh, Tridelphia Ridge, Waverly, and West Friendship because we anticipate the population of Turf Valley, which is still under development, to grow and to continue over the next multiple few years. Up on the screen right now is pages 80, 
81 and 82 of the feasibility study, and the graphics, uh, the graphics show proposed changes in the northeastern, southeastern, and southeastern regions at Bellows Springs Elementary, Deep Run Elementary, uh, Ducketts Lane, Forest Ridge, Laura Woods, and Rockbird Elementary School. Um, this plan proposes to move 685 students to new elementary school 42 and open the school at 82.3% utilization as the population along Route 1 corridor is anticipated to continue in enrollment growth. So this will open the school with enough to open the school, but also allow the school to grow um, over, over a few years. Um, this plan does remove the attendance area islands from Deep Run Elementary School and Rockburn and places them both into new elementary school 42. <clears throat> Above is pages 83 and 84 of the feasibility study and shows proposed changes to Columbia East, Columbia West, Northeastern, and Southeastern. It's really a continuation from the previous slide and shows proposed movement from Bellow Springs, Deep Run, and Deep Run to Waterloo and Rockburn, as well as identifies proposed moves to, at Bryant Woods Elementary School, Clemens Crossing Elementary School. Cradle Rock Elementary School, Guilford Elementary School, Running Brook Elementary School, Stevens Forest Elementary School, and Talbot Springs Elementary School. This plan does propose to remove the islands at Tal Talbot Springs Elementary School. On page five of the 85, excuse me, of the feasibility study, these are proposed changes to the Columbia West and Western regions. Um, and this plan proposes to change boundaries to utilize the Western capacities in order to better utilize the capacities of the West we use Pointers Run and Clarksville to be affected with that. <coughs> um, please turn to Appendix B, uh, page 86 and 87, or yeah, 86 and 87, and the above um, graphic shows changes in the Western Union, uh, Western region to address the Manor Woods growth, uh, specifically with Turf Valley. <coughs> Pages 89, 88 and 89 of the feasibility study. Um, this is a continuation of the moves for, for Manor Woods and is um, specifically, again, to deal with the, the growth in the Turf Valley region. So <clears throat> in summary, this plan um, moves about approximately 4,000 elementary age students, which is about 15% of the projected population at the elementary school level and involves all but nine elementary schools. This plan adjustments are designed to create the new attendance area for elementary school 42 and multiple attendance areas to relieve crowded conditions due to student population growth. This plan can this plan that's before you cannot reasonably address Fulton Centennial Lane, um, although scenarios were tested and, mul um, tested and modeled multiple times. Um, this plan does support uh, pl plan splits turf valley development into three attendance areas, although. Um, Although, with the exception of Fulton, um, Veterans, and Centennial, um, all schools will remain in target um, through 2022. And this is what it would look like in 2022. <coughs> Typically, with an elementary school redistricting, we do actually look to the next level to see if any of the boundary changes that we have will um, mess up any type of feeds that would occur from creating the new attendance area. Um, this plan does recommend boundary changes at the middle school level at a more comprehensive level that has been um, shown in previous feasibility studies um, and consider some relief to Dunlogan, Ellicott Mills, uh, Harper's Choice, uh, Lime Kiln, and Tur um, Thomas Viaduct Middle School. And unlike the high school and the elementary school levels, there actually is no Western capacity at the middle school. Um, to absorb any type of enrollment growth. Um, but minor adjustments through this plan um, prioritizes aligning feeds and balancing capacity utilization. The next few slides go through um, the changes suggested by staff and are in the feasibility study. These um, slides up here are pages 90 and 91 of the feasibility study and show changes in the north, northern, northeastern, and western regions. Boundary adjustments here align feeds at the elementary school level. Specific polygon moves are described on page 40 of the feasibility study with the from the from school, the receiving school, and the projected amount of population that will be um, moved for these alignments. Um, schools affected with these moves include Bonnie Branch, Burley Manor, Dunlogan, Ellicott Mills, Lake Elkhorn, Mayfair Woods, Mount View, Oakland Mills, Patapsco Middle School, and Thomas Viaduct Middle School. On pages 92 and 93 of the feasibility, the graphic shows 
changes to the northeastern and southeastern and Columbia East and West regions. The purpose of these boundary changes reflect changes in enrollment growth, feeds, and balance capacity utilization. These maps are also a continuation of 90 and 91, and the schools that are shown up here are Ellicott, Mill, Ellicott Mills Middle School, Bonnie Branch Middle School, Dunlong, and Harper's Choice, Lake Elkhorn, Mayfield Woods, Murray Hill, Oakland Mills, Patuxent, Wild Lake, and Thomas Viaduct. As stated earlier, this plan proposes some relief to uh, Dunlagan and Ellicott Mills. However, without the additions that are outlined in the capital, um, capital improvement section of the feasibility study, they will remain at 115% utilization. So without additions, those schools, even with redistricting, would remain at 115%. And how we do our modeling is we put in the capital projects in the years that we anticipate them at. So if those don't happen, then the utilization will be at 115%. On pages 94 and 95 of the feasibility study, this graphic shows proposed changes to Columbia East and Western regions and boundary adjustments here align feeds at the elementary school level and includes Bonnie Branch, Clarksville, Dunlogan, Ellicott Mills, Elk Ridge Landing, Bali Quarter, Harper's Choice, Lake Elkhorn, Lime Kiln, Mayfield Woods, Oakland Mills, and Lime, Wild Lake Middle School. On page 96 and 97 of the feasibility study, the above graphic shows proposed changes to the Western region. Boundary adjustments here align feeds at the elementary school level and include Glenwood Middle School, Folly Quarter, and Mountview Middle Schools. In summary, the plan proposed in the feasibility study moves approximately 1,076 middle school students, about 8% of the projected population for 2018, and involves all but one middle school, which is Hammond Middle School. The middle school plan adjustments are designed to prioritize two factors, aligning feeds and balancing school capacity. Unlike, as I said earlier, unlike the elementary school and high school, no capacity exists in the West. These adjustments allow schools to grow. However, it is important to note that this, this plan includes capital improvements to Dunlogan and Ellicott Mills. And this is what it would look in 2022. Uh, so if we do not balance high school attendance areas in 2018, the utilization is depicted up on the screen. Four, four high schools, excuse me, are above um, the policy standard and 110% um, utilization and four below the standard. Essentially, in short, there's a thousand seat need in the east and a thousand seat surplus in the west. <clears throat> and the following slides depict staff suggested changes at the high school level to balance capacity at the high school and align the feeds. Um, <clears throat> it should be noted that about 880 um, existing high school students are rising seniors, so the class of 2019 would not be affected, and we are estimating this because, again, we're working off projections. Um, since Policy 6010, which was um, adopted in January by this board, um, stated that rising seniors should not be redistricted. However, this plan in front of you does not recommend or um, consider rising 11th graders, which is also added into the policy, which would be the class of 2020. And sometimes what the board has done in the past is consider trailing siblings. So if a person had, if I had a senior and I had an incoming freshman, they would trail each other and go through the system. This plan does not recommend that. <clears throat> So for the high school boundary adjustments um, on pages 98 and 99 shows the, uh, changes to the northeastern, Columbia East, and western regions. Specific polygon moves are described on page 41 and shows projected numbers of students being moved as well as the sending and receiving schools. Um, <clears throat> these, these maps here show proposed movement from Athelton, Hammond, Howard, Mount Hebron, Longreach, Oakland Mills, and Wild Lake High Schools. On page 100 and 101 of the feasibility study shows cho uh, proposed changes to the southeastern Columbia East and western regions. It shows proposed movements again from Athelton, Hammond, Howard, Mount Hebron, Longreach, and Oakland Mills. On pages 102 and 103 um, shows proposed changes to the western region and it shows movement from Athelton, Centennial High School, Marriott's Ridge High School, River Hill High School, and Wild Lake High School. Page 104 uh, shows um, proposed changes and shows movement actually from River Hill to Glen Elg, this specific slide. <coughs> 
on pages 105 and 106 of the feasibility um, shows more changes to the western region and shows proposed movement from Glen Elk High School, Marriott's Ridge High School, and River Hill High School. In summary, this plan moves approximately 3,691. Of those, about 888 are rising seniors. Um, the total student pop is about 20% of the total 2018 projected population and actually involves all but one high school, which is Reservoir. This plan adjustments are designed to prioritize the two factors, aligning feeds and balancing capacity utilization. The general historic issue that I wanted to let everyone know about is with boundary adjustments to the high school, the need for seats generally occur in the east and the, de and the additional seats are in the west. And geographically, we have three high schools that are within two miles of each other. Um, <clears throat> this plan will last only for a 2018 school year. Howard and Longreach um, will become at 111% capacity utilization in 2019 and Centennial High School will be at 112 percent utilization in 2019. The flip side or not taking any action would result in the four schools um, that I mentioned earlier and they would be at 136.8 percent capacity utilization that's Howard 119 percent that would be Longreach uh, Centennial High School at 122.9 percent and Mount Hebron at 113.9 percent capacity utilization. Athelton does have, Athelton High School does have the most uh, turnover with this plan, sending a lot of students and receiving a lot of students. Some may ask, why is my school affected? I'm not overcrowded. Um, the simplest explanation is to access seats in the West the, and the nature of high schools being regional in and of themselves. Um, one must go through the center of the county. So in order to go from East to the West, you have to go through the middle. In general, this plan does last until 2022 with seven of our 12 schools being um, within the board's target policy. But what this also does show is we still do need a high school number 13 to add seats to relieve the anticipated uh, population projection along the Route 1 corridor, which is again, Howard, Longreach, Oakland Mills, Athelton, um, Hammond, and Reservoir High Schools. The policy um, requires us uh, to um, basically assess the plan, every plan that is proposed um, based on our board policies. Um, and those, poli those are located in standard sections 4B. Um, so we did that. And this plan does increase the number of schools that are projected to have improved capacity utilization in 2018. It also increases the longevity of schools being in um, that target utilization between 90 and 110%. <laughs> Um, it reduces the number of schools with capacity utilization below 90%. Um, we do anticipate the mileage to change and increase because we're utilizing the Western uh, capacity and so therefore the attendance areas are bigger. So seat times and time, distant time travel we naturally think will increase. Um, school bell time changes will alter any kind of transportation impacts that we will have in this redistricting plan. Um, and we may create some bus riders out of walkers. However, on the flip side, we haven't addressed potential walk areas based on the proposal and we are doing that right now. So even though on the face of it, we might lose walkers, we might actually gain walkers depending on how the, policy, the, the uh, attendance areas um, are created. We do decrease, uh, decrease small number of feeds. Uh, we eliminate one double small feed. In case anyone wants to know what a double small feed is, that means you're Neighborhood is a neighborhood that goes to the middle school and then another small feed to the high school. So we did eliminate double small, uh, one double small feed. And we also decreased the number of non-contiguous areas or those islands that we keep talking about. <clears throat> um, two items have changed with the adoption of policy 6010 in January. The first is the policy requires the board to notify the public of its decision for the superintendent to proceed or not to proceed with the formation of the attendance area committee and adjustment, rec um, and adjustment recommendations. Um, this may be accomplished by the board taking action tonight and notifying the public the, um, through its action that redistricting um, what the board wishes, actions the superintendent wishes to take. The second item that has changed, and you'll see that shortly with um, Tim Rogers, is a charter from the superintendent um, describing his rec and telling the board what the recommend who's recommended for the AAC, um, which is reflected in policy 6010, the implementation procedures. So that said, staff recommends the appointment of the AAC and the initiation of the attendance area adjustment process for 2017. 
Going a little forward um, up here on the screen is the anticipated schedule that will occur. Um, again, we are at the beginning and I can, my office cannot stress that um, as much. We've been receiving a multitude of phone calls um, and we promise to get to every single one of you. Just give us a little time and a little patience. We have um, a lot of emails that we're addressing, hundreds and hundreds of emails and um, phone calls. Um, so we are trying to systematically go through them all. Um, <clears throat> We will have our first attendance area committee meeting starting June 27th. Um, all those meetings are open to the public. Anybody's welcome to come and observe what happens. Um, the first night we will train them and show them what, is, what their role is, um, which is identified in the policy um, through this process. Um, at times we will be, uh, the AAC will say to staff, can you please put this online? We wanna get more feedback. We do that, we absolutely do that. Um, if anybody has any recommended polygon moves or boundary changes or any kind of ideas, we take those to the AAC and they also consider that through, throughout the process. I have to say on a personal note, I, this is how I got involved um, through the redistricting process. Uh, I was a PTA president for a couple of years. Um, I happened to be a planner in my day job and I was selected on the AAC for 20, 2012 and 2013. And it is, it is an amazing process. You are heard as a citizen through the AAC. They make every attempt to listen to concerns of parents and, and, and everybody through Howard County. Um, and they will make a recommendation and we will present um, through regional meetings in September, um, the feasibility study recommendations as long, along with the AAC to get more community impact, uh, in, um, not impact, more community feedback. Um, and all of that will be presented to the um, superintendent and he will make his proposed, the proposed um, presentation to the board in October. We'll have several, uh, two public hearings in October, one in October, one in November, and multiple board work sessions. And then action is scheduled right before Thanksgiving. And then once that happens, our office turns into finding out, um, helping with the transition with school administration. Um, up on the screen is my office's contact information. Our website is gonna constantly be updating, so something might not be here today, it'll be there tomorrow. We actually do have, and I'm gonna take the liberty to show that we finally got our survey online today. Um, so here is the, what the survey looks like, and I hope it opens, because you know wireless sometimes doesn't work. Um, but you can actually go in right now on our website, and this is, this is what it looks like, and you can actually provide feedback now for what the, the feasibility study. So as plans evolve through the AAC, this survey will be online. You can type in the plan you're talking about. You can tell us what you like. You can tell us what you don't like. You can tell us any kind of suggestions that you have, and we'll feed that through the AAC. So with that, I will leave it to the board. Mr. Gist, you look like you have something to say? No? no. <laughs> no. I took no. all the words. Um, no. Quick question. Yes. Um, the, uh, the polygon search feature of your... Okay, so that crashed. Yes. Um, we have successfully fixed it. Thanks. So um, you can find out your polygon number through our school and bus locator. Um, we apologize. We've been having some technological fails in our office these last couple of days, and we're really apologetic, but we got it fixed as soon as we... We could. So if you don't know your polygon number and want to know what your polygon is number, you just go on, to hop onto the school and bus locator, which is on the main page of school planning. Um, you can type in your address and you can find out your polygon number. If you still have problems, just call our office. We can help you with it. And if you um, and have you done any changes to the polygons in the last year or two? Uh, we've done, Tim. We've done a couple of minor. Couple of minor. Um, you split some. We've we split some. We've moved. We've um, cut some off. Yeah, we've split some. So um, that also is up on Board Docs. So if you want a rather large scale map of the polygons, you can get that on Board Docs. Um, that also is posted on our website, um, hcpss.org. Uh, school plan. Uh, school hyphen planning. Okay, great. And um, Dr. Altwerger. Thank you. You're welcome. Microphone. Microphone. Oh. Can you just please explain how you decide what streets and neighborhoods are in a given polygon? Um, so that was actually an internal um, about maybe four planning managers ago. 
um, we had to come up with a geography, otherwise you're doing it by hand. So the geography of a polygon is determined, it's all physical boundaries, so street, um, a property line. We um, try to not make a polygon big enough that we don't project more than 100 elementary school students to it. So if we see a new development come online um, or a phase development, for example, Oxford Square is a good example. Um, that was one polygon at one time and it became four polygons um, based on the proposed development and our projected population. So that's how polygons are created. Um, polygons are a typical geography whenever talking about any type of redistricting of any sort. Um, voting precincts is another type of geography that makes up council um, uh, districts so it is a it's a universal standard um, type of geography ours is obviously different than a census block that's another type of polygon um, or a voting precinct if you all look at the polygon maps and you, you know zoom in they they are logical as far as the feet the road patterns you know a, yes. a polygon will <laughs> generally be a street and possibly whatever streets feed onto it, they're, they're not, you know, really just sort of random. They're, they're, they, yeah, they're, they do follow logic. physical features on the land. We don't just draw a line through. Um, if we accidentally draw a line through, we look at the property and tax records to follow the property. So we're not splitting up parcel into two different polygons. Mr. Divin. Well, so I'm sad to say I won't be involved in the redistricting as this is my last meeting, but I just kind of wanted to say like a few quick things. One for the public that is worried, change is okay. I know we want to stick with our communities, but I, you know, this isn't the final project right now. You know, we have a lot of ways to go and through community feedback, there will be changes. Um, and I just want to say from personal experience, um, when my parents bought our house, we were districted to Centennial High School. Um, but throughout the time, we were redistricted to Wild Lake High School. And, you know, uh, people just say different things about schools. And I have to say, I am so grateful I went to Wild Lake High School. Not to say Centennial's bad. I'm a little biased. I think Wild Lake's the best. But, you know, you know, all these things are going to different happen. And every school in Howard County is absolutely phenomenal. So if you are worried about your student not getting a, a great access to an education at another school, uh, you need to start re rethinking that. You know, every school is really great and they're all going to have amazing opportunities to what they can for their education. So please reevaluate sometimes what you are thinking. Is the sole issue really the education? I want people to just take a step back and really reevaluate their positions because change is not always a bad thing. And, you know, uh, sticking with your community is always a great thing. But, you know, maybe if you step outside your community, you can find new people to embrace you and new people to communicate with you. I just think we really just need to really think where we're thinking from. Sorry if that got repetitive, but. Well, the, Thank you very much. I've mentioned to our f f group the, uh, the two things that are very clear is one is everyone likes their own school or loves their own school and, um, and they just don't want to be jerked around. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that everybody feels heard and that what we end up with in November is logical and supportable and right. includes all of what's going on in the county, including, you know, the uh, 13th high school that right. will be coming and the changes in the start times that will be coming and the, um, all of the things that everyone has been emailing us about. I mean, we've, we all, yeah, well, except for Divin, we've, Divin. It's late. Griffin, <laughs> Griffin, we've all had children in this school system and we've all experienced at some point um, redistricting on some level. And I know that we're all going to make sure that we do everything we can to make sure that everybody leaves, if not thrilled, um, at least heard. Anybody else? I'm not, just kind of talking until I got any more. No one else? We, we need to take a vote. <laughs> On what? You gotta, <laughs> you gotta initiate the process for the 2017 redistricting. So the motion will be something along the lines of. I, I have a motion that. I can read. Oh, awesome. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. You're going to move to proceed with the recommendation of the attendance area adjustment review for school year 2018 and 19. Do I hear so moved? 
I so move. Okay. Do we have a so second? A so second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion by Ms. Ellis and a second by Mr. Divin. Dr. Altberger? Yes. Ms. Valancourt? Yes. Can he second if he's not allowed to vote? He can second it, but he just can't vote on it. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Ellis? Yes. Ms. Delmont Small? Yes. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Yeah, I was afraid that someone was going to say, okay, I move that we adopt this plan, and then I was oh, afraid that we oh, wouldn't dear. get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything else on today's agenda that we need to yeah. deal yes, with? Yes, we need to present the, the charter Chinese now. Oh, yes, we still have I'm more. so sorry, I'm it's looking okay. at that. Looking right at it, please. Okay, well, we're gonna give it a minute. Anyone who wants to escape, now's a good time. They should be interested in it. Oh, are you? Oh, I'm surprised.